I went to Adisala first before uh, Achimota. Yeah. And that is very important. <laughs> <laughs> that is very important. I'd like to correct that. And uh, my little town, Anyimum. Yes, near Jine Jine. You've heard of Jine Jine? Jine Jine is very far away from Techiman. And yet, you hear that little town next to Techiman. When they sing, they say our capital is Jine Jine. Yeah, it is not um, ge geographically correct. Anyway, um, I feel very honored to have been asked to share my reflections on aspects of our Constitution. When I got the invitation, I asked myself, why me? Why does anybody think that my reflections will be interesting or useful? So that was my initial reaction. Then I thought a bit about it, and I decided that I'll take it as an invitation to contribute to a democratic dialogue. And a democratic dialogue is reason based. I want us to note that. And because it's reason based, persons who have contrary views can agree to disagree on reasonable grounds and in mutual respect. In that context, you could say that practically anybody's reflections might be interesting or useful, provided they are reason-based, because they could then stimulate an interesting or a useful discussion. So, moderator, it is quite a long time now since Ghana adopted democracy as the ben uh, benchmark for running its affairs as a nation. If we take the time we became an independent country at the beginning, we have been on the road to democracy for over 60 years now, albeit punctuated by considerable periods of military rule. I think that our own history and the histories of other countries clearly show that this path to democracy is not one of linear progression. So it is useful to view democracy in practice as a work in progress that calls for continual appraisal to see whether we are on the right path. Against that backdrop, my reflections on our democracy are limited in two ways to the three specified aspects, namely the Constitution, elections, and the judiciary, and to our endeavors in the Fourth Republic only. I will, I will give the reflections in the specified order, beginning with the Constitution. Our current Constitution is a fourth since independence. It has lasted for three decades, nearly half of the entire life of our country as an independent nation, and in fact, longer than the three previous constitutions put together thus far. On that basic fact alone, some people say that we have not done badly. In fact, we have done reasonably well 
by the Fourth Republican Constitution. The fact that it has lasted so long. And they point in particular to the fact that we have succeeded to elect a government peacefully through the ballot box each of the specified uh, periods during the 30 years. But I think that that notwithstanding, there are clear signs of deconsolidation of our democracy. Over the years, we have become poorer as a nation and as a people due mainly to pervasive corruption, particularly in the public sector, in public life. Unfortunately, some of our key institutions are becoming institutions of dubious integrity. Increasingly, candidates who lose elections are alleging manipulation and refusing to accept the results. By and large, we have not been able to diffuse the principles of democratic behavior widely into our society. And there is a general lack of predictability in social life, which is a disincentive to proper behavior. Some people will say that these are perceived and not real ailments of our democracy. But that doesn't change the picture at all. Because for purposes of trust and confidence in public institutions and public office holders, perception is as important as reality. In any case, in all probability, some of these factors have contributed to the many calls to amend our Constitution. I think three things relating to amending the Constitution are worthy of note. First, the amendment process is likely to be a long one because it will require, as a first step, a referendum done on its own or attached to a general election. Secondly, because practically everything that goes awry in our country is somehow often blamed on the Constitution, it will be difficult to amend the Constitution to the satisfaction of the general public. But we must be careful not to unnecessarily tinker with the Constitution. Thirdly, the extent to which amending the Constitution will cure the ailments of our democracy is a moot issue. Although the example of Singapore shows that it is possible to use law to change people's attitudes and behavior. The moderator, in spite of the foregoing caveats, in principle, the calls for, to amend the Constitution are in order. Because a Constitution is not like a Bible whose precepts are held to be unchangeable. If it were so, a constitution would not contain procedures for making changes to it. In fact, by law, on a regular basis, some countries do an appraisal of their constitutional performance over the preceding period with a view to making recommendations for effective performance where necessary. This practice may be worth our consideration 
in changing, in amending our constitution. I'm aware that individuals have made several recommendations for changes to our constitution. And I also know that a body of officially sponsored recommendations for that purpose exists. But I must say that my reflections are without prejudice to any such recommendations. Against that backdrop, my reflections on the Constitution will consist of short statements, and I mean short, short statements, relating to three issues. The separation of powers between the executive and the legislature, the Council of State, and local government. The separation of powers is intended to make it possible for one branch of government to check any excesses of another branch. In my view, with about half of ministers plus some of the de deputy ministers drawn from parliament, the legislature cannot effectively check the executive. Cabinet decisions are binding on ministers and deputy ministers and they must be defended by them, including in parliament. I think that a system where ministers and their deputies are drawn from outside parliament will be better suited to holding the executive in check. Indeed, the requirement to appoint so many ministers from parliament may be an incentive for a president to increase the number of ministers in order to minimize potential trouble with Parliament. Now, the Council of State. We would all agree that the Council of State has an, an imposing name. But the way it has so far gone about its work has made it look like an honorific institution without power. Yet, apart from the president, the council has power to advise every public institution in Ghana. Based on my own experience at the Electoral Commission, I can say that the council takes briefings from public institutions and gives them advice in turn. I think it will, be, it will help the public to gauge the council's impact if periodically it issues a report indicating what advice it has given to which institution. In the council's relation with the president, there is one thing in particular that I think requires clarification. The president appoints some people in consultation with the council and some on the advice of the council. What is the difference? Some lawyers say there is no difference at all and the president can do as he pleases in both instances. But others say that unlike consultation, in the case of advice, the president cannot appoint unless he is so advised. If that is indeed the case, it must be made explicit in any amendment to the Constitution so that the president cannot ignore the advice of the council. Now, look at government. I strongly believe that we cannot achieve any appreciable level of development in this country without fundamental reforms in our local government system. I strongly believe that. 
Perhaps the failure of our local government system is best dramatized by the not infrequent calls on the president and the central government to provide toilets for towns and villages. That, for me, dramatizes the failure of our local government. Clearly, what we have now is the shadow and not the substance of decentralization. But I think a number of things could be done to make decentralization real. One, we must abandon the earlier idea of gradual devolution of powers, go back to the drawing board, and give the assemblies district, municipal, and metropolitan real and adequate power, powers and resources to decide and do things on their own. Two, I share the view that a district, municipal, and metropolitan chief executives must be elected to promote their accountability to the local people. Three, I also share the view that we should stop playing the ostrich and open the election of the members of the district, municipal, and metropolitan assemblies to political party participation. However, I think that the election formula should not be the first past the post but the form of proportional representation called mixed member proportional. I'll leave it at that. I cannot go explaining it, but I want you to keep it in mind. No first part of the post for electing the district assembly members. Let us try my, my recommendation, the mixed member proportional formula for electing people. I think if we use that formula, it holds the promise of bringing more political parties into the local government system. As it is today, I think it is predominantly NDC, NPP, even though we say it's non-partisan. Everybody knows that the composition of the, uh, these assemblies, predominantly NDC and PP. Four, I think it should be made an offense to delay the release of any statutory allocation of funds to the assemblies. The present system whereby maybe first, second allocations do not go. Six months, no allocations come. I think it should be an offense to delay the release of funds. Finally, on local government, my understanding is that the elected members of the assemblies do not receive salary for their work. They do not receive pay. Nor are they giving money to develop their respective electoral areas. If this is correct, what is the justification for members of parliament receiving money from the district assemblies common fund? I think it is a discriminatory practice and must discontinue, particularly as it appears not to have any legal basis at all. I've asked many people, is there any legal basis for them receiving the money? 
and nobody seems to know. Maybe the journalists here, you can take the matter up and find out whether there is in some way legal basis for the um, MPs receiving money from the from the common fund. If not, it is not good for our members of parliament to live with an illegality. That is all that I want to say about the constitutional issues. I want now to move on to the uh, elections. The kind of democracy that Ghana opted for is one where the citizens choose their political leaders through free and fair elections. It is true that there is much more to democracy than free and fair elections. But there can be no doubt at all that free and fair elections are not only the proper gateway to legitimate leadership, but they are also essential for good governance and democratic consolidation. Obviously, that makes the Electoral Commission a key institution in our democracy. However, that is not to say that the Electoral Commission is the most important factor in a democratic election. I think that this comes out clearly in a simplified definition of a democratic election as a contest among political parties or candidates mediated by an electoral commission and decided by the votes of the electorate. Based on this definition, voters come first followed by political parties and candidates, and then the Electoral Commission in a ranking order of importance of the three main actors in a democratic election. <laughs> I think the justification for this ranking is rather straightforward. There can be no election at all, if there are no candidates. And an election cannot be said to be democratic if there are no voters to decide the winner. For this reason, the primacy of the voter and the attendant sanctity of the duly cast vote I regarded as central pillars of the principles of electoral justice. The ranking also underscores the need for political parties to be closely involved in the electoral process. In this regard, I think that the Electoral Commission must view the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, IPAC, as a convenient forum for discussing changes to our electoral practices, irrespective of whether the intended change originates from the Commission or the parties. The reason is that it is not good practice to foist changes in electoral practices, electoral practices on important stakeholders like political parties. It is prudent to discuss any intended changes thoroughly at IPAC meetings with a view to achieving consensus. If consensus is achieved, the IPAC then becomes a convenient vehicle for disseminating the changes to the electorate. Let me say that during discussions at the IPAC, the Electoral Commission is not bound to accept the position even if it is supported by all the political parties. It's not a voting matter. 
How many parties do you have? On the books, maybe about 19. How many, how many commissioners are there? Assuming that all of them go to her party. Seven. If all of them, there need to be 19 to seven. No, it is not that kind of matter. And the reason why they are not bound to accept some decision even if all the political parties support it, is that the political parties can take a stand which constitutes an obstacle to the realization of the electoral rights of the people. When that happens, it is the duty of the Electoral Commission to uphold and protect the rights and interests of the people. I'd like to give a very simple example. The political parties once wanted the Electoral Commission to make it mandatory for people to produce their voter ID cards on election day before they are allowed to vote. The Electoral Commission said no to this no card, no vote campaign. Explaining that it is the Constitution and not the card that creates the right to vote. The card makes it easy to identify you as a registered voter. So, on election day, if your name is on the register, which is the legal requirement, but you don't have the card with you, then the onus lies on you to identify yourself to the satisfaction of the persons conducting the election. Fortunately, the political parties eventually agreed with the Commission's position. In contrast, the current Electoral Commission's drive to make the Ghana card the only document for voter registration, when that card is not easily accessible to all Ghanaians, and its refusal to consider the request by the political parties to do the 2023 limited voter registration at the electoral area level closer to the people than at the district level would seem to indicate that the political parties are now the ones defending the interests of the voter. The Electoral Commission has a sound legal framework which guarantees its independence. The Commission has power to make law by a constitutional in instrument whereby it proposes laws and Parliament approves them. So the Commission and Parliament share responsibility for changes to our electoral laws and practices. This feature is better suited to protecting the electoral rights of citizens than instances where the Electoral Commission makes law through a minister. Our election structure is durable with effective participation of the political parties in the electoral processes. The Commission has well-trained, professionally competent technical staff. These attributes make the Commission well endowed to manage elections. The fact that free and fair elections are essential to our democracy means that the Electoral Commission always has to deliver free and fair elections whose outcomes are credible enough to be acceptable as a basis for forming a legitimate government. 
of several factors that an electoral commission requires to be able to achieve free and fair elections to our paramount. First, it must make solid preparations from voter registration through voting operations to the collation of votes and the declaration of results. In doing so, it must pay particular attention to points where the election process is vulnerable to adulteration. I'm sure that the Electoral Commission is aware that most of the election controversies in recent times have centered on the counting and collation of votes. For this reason, I consider the setting up of regional collation centers in our presidential election to be a retrogressive step because it increases the number of points at which results can be manipulated. I understand that we borrowed the practice from Nigeria. Surprisingly, at a time when Nigeria was seeking ways to send results straight from the polling stations to one location. It is to be noted that Parliament approved the practice. The second requirement for achieving free and fair elections is a favorable external environment. In this regard, I have said many times that an electoral commission can make the best preparations possible for an election. But if the external environment is not right, the prospect for a free and fair election can be likened to washing a piece of white cloth in milky water and hoping that it will not be stained. Unfortunately, several aspects of our elections are unacceptable because of murky factors in the external environment. And I want to call attention to four of them. First, violence. Some people say that violence in our elections did not start yesterday. No. But instead of decreasing over the years, it appears to be increasing in both numbers and intensity. If our two major political parties are to be believed, they no longer have militias. If they are to be believed. But what is even more worrying is the allegation of the involvement of national security personnel in election violence. I'm afraid this is very serious and foreboding for our democracy. Two, disrespect for other candidates. Instead of mutual respect for other candidates seeking the same office, the tendency has been to show open disrespect for the other candidate and try by any means, fair or foul, to portray him or her as unworthy of the office. Oftentimes, the same attitude is portrayed by the supporters of the respective candidate. In such an atmosphere, political campaigning loses its essence as an opportunity for candidates to tell voters what policies they will put in place to solve their problems and improve their conditions of life. Three, 
too many promises. In place of enunciating policies, our politicians spend a lot of time making and repeating promises to the electorate. One cannot be sure that even the politicians themselves believe that they can fulfill the, the numerous promises that they make. Anyway, they seem to forget that unfulfilled promises can be a millstone around a politician's neck. The negative effects can be devastating because even party members who were not part of the promise-making enterprise may find it difficult to extricate themselves from the effects. Four, vote buying. In days gone by, whatever vote buying or vote selling there was took place in secrecy. Not so these days. What we have now looks like an open market where candidates can freely buy votes and citizens can freely sell their votes in broad daylight while we all look on seemingly unconcerned. But it is a shameful spectacle because vote buying and vote selling are unlawful and they undermine two important principles that underpin our democracy. Vote buying undermines the idea that we choose our leaders out of our free will. And vote selling undermines the idea that we hold our elected leaders accountable through elections. I believe that our democracy is kaput when election results cease to be a true representation of our verdict on the performance of our leaders. And we cannot therefore hold them accountable through elections. And that precisely is what the emerging open market in votes portends. I'm sure that there are other factors about our elections that you may consider to be unsatisfactory. But the ones I have mentioned are enough to indicate that all is not well with our democracy. In fact, there are additional signs of the deconsolidation of our democracy. That is all I want to say about elections to now. I will now turn briefly to the judiciary. We will all agree that street protests and media wars are not appropriate ways of resolving disagreements over electoral matters. Neither can achieve authoritative and minding conclusions. Besides, street actions can be costly in terms of human and property loss. With regard to the media, it has become extremely difficult to distinguish between genuine media and counterfeit media because of the preponderance of one-sided, even distorted, presentation of issues in the partisan media, the indiscretions of some serial callers, especially into radio discussions, and the irresponsible use of social media for political purposes. Nor do we know the impact that artificial intelligence will make on elections in view of its ability to create voices and visual images 
that are virtually indistinguishable from the real ones. Add to this the fact that election-related matters cannot be an exception to the rule of law. And you can readily see why the judiciary is an integral part of our electoral system. As a general rule, election cases are urgent cases that need to be decided as quickly as practicable. Except where the court genuinely does not know what to do in the particular situation. An example of such a situation occurred in Washington, D.C., in America. A candidate was officially sworn into office as a winner in the city council election when all the overseas votes had not been counted. Later, after collating the overseas votes, a different candidate emerged as the actual winner. The new winner went to court. But the case was not decided during the entire lifespan of the particular council, apparently because a situation like that had never happened before. And the court did not, did not know what to do once somebody had already been officially sworn into office. When the council's life ended, the case was dislodged on the ground that the substance of the action was vacuous. As far as I know, allegations of corrupt judges taking money to decide election cases have been rare in Ghana. However, in recent times, concerns have been expressed about the judicial function in election. These concerns are encapsulated in two interrelated concepts. The judicialization of elections and the politicization of the judiciary. Judicialization of elections refers to the increasing trend of resorting to the judiciary to settle electoral controversies of all kinds. Politicization of the judiciary refers to appointing judges in the hope that they will give judgments that are favorable to a particular political party or cause if the need arises. As to which one comes first, it is like the chicken and egg question. It depends on which chicken or egg one is talking about. Is it the chicken that laid the egg or the egg that hatched into the baby chick. <laughs> so the sequence may differ from one country to another. What we can say for sure is that judicialization begets politicization, and politicization begets judicialization. And the end result is the same. Judges are embedded in the judiciary in anticipation of decisions favorable to a particular political party or cause. I do not know the extent to which judges are so embedded in our judicial system. I don't. But I find it noteworthy that even before the Supreme Court began here in the 2012 presidential election petition. Some Ghanaians were predicting a six to three verdict of the nine justices based on the number of panel members appointed by presidents 
of the two disputing political parties. The prediction did not come true, but it indicates that there was a perception that the decisions of our judges might be influenced by political considerations. Be that as it may, political influence aside, judges may give unsound decisions in election cases for two other reasons. The first reason is insufficient knowledge of elections. Judges are not necessarily experts in elections, and they may sometimes give judgments in election cases without realizing the full implications for the entire electoral process. This is often seen in injunctions and consequential orders. For example, a judge once placed an injunction on holding the district level elections. When some candidates went to his court complaining that there had been no voter education at all in their areas. The areas comprised only six electoral areas out of thousands of such areas in the entire country. But the injunction unwittingly covered the whole country. So if the, yes, if that helped, means we couldn't hold the elections. No, we have how many? I don't want to give you a number, but there are thousands of electoral areas. And we complain about six, and we put an injunction on the entire election, thousands of them. It's because he confessed to me later on that he didn't know. He confessed to me, you know, yes. He was one day, I went and sat with him, we were eating, we were having, you know, uh, we were having discussions with the judiciary about elections. And he was sitting next to me, I gave that example, and he said, ah, I'm the one. <laughs> he, he just didn't know. Similarly, um, a judge once ordered a recount of the votes in a disputed election result case that also ordered that the ballot boxes could only be opened in the presence of the agents of all the four parties that were present at the initial count. All right? He's given the order. Yes, you have to go back and count. Then he adds that you can only open the, the boxes when all the people are, you know, are there. As it turned out, hmm. the two parties not contesting the results were simply not interested in the recount and would not be present. But the judge had said we, we could not open the ballot boxes un until all four of them were there. To a number of occasions, we will notify them, we'll go, and then only two parties. Uh, will be present. In, in such situations, the EC has to get the decision varied by the same court or by another court before it can act. The second reason for unsound judgment is what may be characterized as the lack of purposive interpretation of the law in full-blown um, election petitions. I'd like to spend a bit of time on this because this is not as self-explanatory as the previous one. To start with, let me give an example of what I consider to have been a, pop a purposive interpretation of the law when I was at the Electoral Commission. A Ghanaian citizen then living abroad once walked to the commission's head office and said he wanted to register as a voter so that he could vote 
in an election due to be held in about two months time. It was explained to him that voter registration officially closed more than a month back. So he would have to wait till the next registration period. Not satisfied, he took the commission to court and the court ruled that under our constitution, the right to register to vote is a fundamental right and it is not within the remit of the electoral commission to decide when citizens will enjoy their fundamental rights. I describe that decision as purposive because it was directed at achieving two goals, both of which were consistent with the principles of electoral justice. The first goal was to preserve a citizen's right to register at a time of his or her choice, since registration or voting is not compulsory in Ghana. Comp registration is not compulsory. Voting is not compulsory. So the citizen maybe initially didn't see the reason why he vote. All of a sudden, he said, hey, now maybe he should be able to register. This is what the <laughs> judge was said of us. So it was to preserve that right of the citizen. It is important to note that in principle, the decision imposed on the Electoral Commission is many years back a duty beyond the traditional conception of continuous registration, to voter registration every working day. That's what it meant. The citizen had the right to be registered every working day. That's what the judge was saying. So continuous registration did not begin yesterday. That decision imposed on us. The traditional conception of the continuous registration is that you register this time, you keep the names, you register next time, you add them to the old one. You register next time, you add them, you pile on. But they don't have to be done every day, uh, working day. You can do them at set periods and put them together. And that was a traditional conception. This decision imposed on the commission that every working day if a citizen comes okay must be registered <laughs> of course at that time in deference to the court we registered the uh, the person but we kept our mouth shut <laughs> because we did not have, have the well with her to implement the decision, you know, on a full scale. If people had known that we had registered that person, maybe the following day, the people would come, and people would be coming until a day before election day. Right? So we registered the person, but we kept. Yeah. I think two other people came, and we registered them quietly. <laughs> quietly, yes. Anyway, in essence, the second goal of the decision was to tell the commission to establish a cutoff point of voter registration if continuous registration would cause problems for its work. A cutoff point means that you can place your name in the voter registration database after the cutoff point. But in order not to disrupt the preparations of the Electoral Commission, 
you cannot vote in the impending election. You can only vote in subsequent elections. The EC thereafter established a voter registration cutoff point by law. At that time, we had not established a cutoff point by law. But once we have established a cutoff point by law, now, if you came and you said you wanted to register and you came, <laughs> after we had cut off, then we will add your name to the database, but you cannot vote in the independent election. I understand that the Commission now has the capacity to do every working day registration of voters in its district offices. By way of further elucidation, I wish to follow up the example of purposive interpretation of the law by indicating three things that I think should not happen. That is my interpretation. Three things that should not happen on a purposive interpretation of law. One, a sizable group of people should not be denied representation in parliament for a long time. Because that is plainly inconsistent with the idea of representative government. Two, an election case should not be dismissed forthwith on a technicality like, oh, the case was not filed in time, or the lawyer brought a writ instead of a petition. For all you know, the candidate and the voters may not know the filing deadline, let alone the, the difference between a writ and a petition. And yet, they are the ones who get punished. I think that it would be more appropriate in such a situation to find the lawyer and hear the substantive case. Find the, the lawyer and then go ahead and hear the substantive case. Three, a judge should not cancel some duly cast votes and declare the winner of an election. If there is a mathematical chance that the affected votes can make a difference in the result. The reason is that doing so amounts to the judge usurping a function reserved exclusively for the people in the true democracy. It is more appropriate to order a rerun of the election for the people to decide. I wish to make three recommendations concerning electoral accountability and democratic consolidation to conclude my reflections. First, as in all human endeavors, mistakes occur in elections. But genuine election mistakes can readily be discovered and corrected. Not so deliberate wrongdoing. To deter deliberate wrongdoing, all persons connected with the conduct of elections must be held strictly accountable for their actions by instituting a stringent regime of punishment for willful wrongdoing. All categories of election workers must be familiarized with the applicable regime of sanctions during their training and any infractions must be seen to be punished. Two, it appears that some candidates rush to court with election petitions alleging manipulation of results primarily to placate 
their financiers and supporters so that they will be given another chance to be a candidate at the next time. The rush can cause undeserved injury to the reputation of the Electoral Commission and unnecessarily in unnecessary inundation of the courts. As we speak, there are well over 1,000 election petitions before the courts in Nigeria following the 2023 elections. Yes, well over 1,000 election petitions. Some of them uh, will not be concluded you know, before the next election itself. Hmm. To prevent the rush to court with improbable election petitions from becoming a fashion, I suggest that election petitions that do not succeed should attract punitive sanctions. Yes. Hmm. Thirdly, in view of the importance of the judicial function elections, I wish to recommend collaboration between the Judiciary and the Electoral Commission to institute a program of continuing education for judges on elections. Such a program will improve the delivery of electoral justice which in turn will contribute to electoral accountability and the consolidation of our democracy. In conclusion, let me say that free and fair elections are indispensable for the health of our democracy. We must all understand that it is an onerous responsibility to deliver free and fair elections and that it is in our collective interest as citizens irrespective of our positions in society to help the electoral commission in any way we can to deliver free and fair elections the least we should expect from everybody is proper election behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know. Yes, please.